as we start every show. Big Sills! What a 24 hours. I have never seen a center celebrated the way I have seen Jason Kelsey celebrated for the last 24 hours. I have never. This guy was so popular, Facebook and Instagram crashed. Yeah. I mean, holy shit, man. Unbelievable. And you know what? Rightfully so, too. Even the Pro Football Hall of Fame threw out like a bat signal for 2029. 2029. Just in case you're wondering. Jason Kelsey will be eligible for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You're like, wow. You got the Hall of Fame without the voters telegraphing he's eligible in 29. Not sure I've seen that. Not sure I've ever seen that. For a center. We're not talking about a quarterback, which is usually the face of that respected organization and team. Right? We're talking about a freaking center. A guy whose name you never bring up ever during the regular year. And the only reason that you brought him up is because of the tush push. Other than that, how many old linemen get bat signals from the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton? Hey, if you're wondering, 2029 Jason Kelsey will be eligible for a gold jacket. Kelsey should be a first ballot. He will. He will be a first ballot. Wouldn't it be great him and Eric Allen going in together? I think that would be great. Now, look, I threw this out. And please, don't have recency biased. Kelsey is not the greatest eagle of all time. It's Reggie. Kelsey is the most revered and loved eagle of all time. There's a difference. One means more. Revered and loved and respected. That means more than the greatest eagle player of all time. Okay? That means more. Look, the fans love Reggie White, Brian Dawkins, Bednarik. Depending on your age, you're going to pick one of those guys. The younger guys are probably going to go with Kelsey. Xander's not wrong. Guy who got the city. Bednarik got the city. You understand that Chuck Bednarik was the face of the league along with Nitsky and Butkus and Huff in New York. They were representing the league. Quarterbacks didn't represent the league back in the 50s and 60s. The middle linebacker position did. Butkus in Chicago, Nitsky in Green Bay, Huff in New York, and Nitsky in Philadelphia. Those were the faces of the league. The league has changed so much. The faces of the league today are the quarterbacks. And when you get a center getting that kind of love. By the way, when it comes to the greatest player, Eagle, my friends, it's not close, Kelsey and White. It's not close. Reggie's one of the three greatest players in the sports history. You can make the argument him and Lawrence Taylor are the two greatest football players along with Jerry Rice that ever lived, along with Brown. Those four guys are the greatest players in the sport. So when you say Kelsey's a greater player, he's not. He's more revered and respected and loved by the city. I I agree with you. I agree with you. Okay? Steve, you you get where I'm coming from? By the way, this is not a shade or a rip kind of, So we're talking about the greatest players in the history of the game. Dawkins, 
Reggie, <laughs> Jason Kelsey. These are the greatest players of all time. Hey, guess what? Sills, I'm taking Reggie. Okay, I'll take Brian Dawkins or Kelsey. You're okay, man. I always had this conversation with people. When, when they're talking about LeBron or you're talking about Jordan, hey, I'm taking Jordan. Fine, I'll take LeBron. Let's go play 48 minutes. Let's see what happens. You're not going to go wrong with either guy is the point. Flexing goes, LT was a cocaine monster on the field. I don't care. I'm not a team doctor. I could give a shit what he does. I'm his coach. If this guy is doing demons and has demons off the field, who am I? I'm not his keeper. Hey, everybody has a right to destroy their life or elevate their life. I'm not there to help. I'm not there to tell you what to do. I don't tell people how to live their lives. Is it true? Yeah. So that's not an indictment as a player. That's more of an indictment on him and self-destruction. That's got nothing to do with player. Nothing. Zero. Aaron Rodgers being an asshole. That's got nothing to do with how great he is. You guys try to put like a player's behavior into like, like yeah, how great was he? Has nothing to do with it. I, I, I would hire, you know, Xander and I were talking about this. I would hire a guy I hated. And if he wanted to work with me and he's one of the greatest salesmen or he's one of the greatest hosts of all time. And if we could have some type of respect for one another, I would hire him. You know why? I'm looking to better my company. I'm not looking to sit there and go, no, I can't work with that. That's not going to work for me. Hey, well, then you're not hiring the best people, and you're not a very good coach. You think coaches like all the players they coach? You think players like playing? You think Brady? And, look at Brady and Belichick. The topsy-turvy relationship those two guys had. Great example of it. Great example. Okay? Anybody taking Kelsey or Dawkins over Reggie White or Lawrence Taylor's nuts? Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. It's a hard choice, Big Sales. Hey, I, I put a poll up on my, thank you very much, on my Twitter page, at Dan Cilio Show. Okay? I put, I, I, put a, I put a Twitter poll up, and right now, people are saying Reggie, obviously. But again, it's it's this is really not shade. It's not shade at all. I think it's been remarkable just to hang on Jason Kelsey a little bit here, to see all the people throwing love at him, all the national folks, all the local guys. It's not just a Philly thing. And I do agree. One of the things that I'm becoming more familiar with here is how you guys act. You know what it is? You guys will call me an asshole, some of you. Will call me an asshole for five days. But next week, you'll call me an asshole for five more days. I respect that. I respect that. Isn't it funny? I don't think a lot of people would respect that. I respect it. Big show today, bottom of the hour. Phil Sims from CBS Sports, for, former Super Bowl MVP. On the desk at CBS, he will join us at the bottom of this hour at 2.30, Phil Sims. Gary Cobb at 4.30 will join us. Former Eagle in ESPN, morning host from Mike and Mike. Mike Gullick, former Eagle, as I said, will be with us also at 5.30. So today, Phil Sims, bottom of the hour. Gary Cobb, 4.30 from Fox 29 in Philly. 5.30, we will have Mike Gullick. So we welcome you aboard. By the way, March 13th, 1 o'clock Eastern. First time free agency kicks in. So this thing is going to be hot and heavy. But once again, no shade. No shade. Paul... Uh, Dumowitz at 4.30, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. Unless we're having political talk, there's no Paul Dumowitz that will ever be on this program. 
Yeah. Oh, my God. He probably hates the Supreme Court now. I'll leave that alone and not go too deep into it. Hey, Trent, you better not post anything about 9 nothing. Trent Cole, SOS. Don't print anything about 9 nothing, or Dumbawitz will be all over your ass. Here, we'll leave it alone. Move on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's do this. Hold on here. Seahawks releasing Jamal Adams. Holy cow. They gave up three ones for that guy. They gave up three first. Was it two first? No, they gave him 20 million a year. And they gave up, I think, three ones. Three ones for him. See you later. Goodbye. Oh, and 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 hey, this is a message for my boy. Bill Colarulo, is it? Yeah. I actually like Bill. He's he's good. You know, he's got a lot of good takes and yeah, whatever. He he's he's good. You know, he wanted Anton Winfield Jr. from the Bucks. The Bucks just tagged him for 17.1 million. Do you really think Howie was gonna open up the wallet or basically slide the zipper down off the wallet? Because Howie's got one of those zipper wallets. You know, one of them zipper wallets, you know, you just zip, you got to zip it up, man. <laughs> you know, just not the cannoli. You got to zip up the wallet because, you know, you got the owner's money in that wallet with the zipper. You didn't really think the Eagles were going to pay $17.1 million for his safety, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the, he's a corner, Jalen Johnson. That's $20 million. So they're taking all the good players off the market right now. Brian Burns also, $17 million tag. Yes, sir, baby. And if you want Burns, you have to give up two ones because now he's got the franchise tag. Hey, Flexen, I don't really think it's Howie being cheap. I think the owner told him, we have a budget. This is it. You work within this budget. Move the money around. And go ahead. I can't see Howie Roseman just sitting there going, well, I'm not going to spend someone else's money. I think he's got a budget. I think they come up and they put a value on every position that they have on the field. And they put an economic, which is wrong. They put an economic value on every position before they even put the player in there. Because it gives them a plan. Well, linebacker is not that big an issue. So we'll isolate and we'll really put all of our resources on corner and edge and tackle. And the rest of those guys, unfortunately, the middle of your football field, your linebackers and your safeties are where you struggle the most. If you believe Howard would pay $17.1 million for his safety, I got a bridge in Brooklyn. Howie is not spending that kind of money. Hey, it's one thing to want a Rolex. But when you work in, in Philly and you play defense, you wear a citizen's watch. And the one that's not waterproof, you can't wear it in your bathtub. That's the kind of watch you wear. That when you go to some other places in the league, you get to wear a Submariner. You don't get to wear, you know, those great, those great Rolexes. But when you work in Philly and you play defense, and you're not a premium position, okay? You were a citizen that it kind of gets foggy when you're in your bathtub if you leave your watch on. That's kind of that's the kind of money they spend. It could be a hand-me-down too, by the way. We can get Gardner Johnson back for less than oh yeah, dude. Gardner Johnson, his value went down. He's not a six million dollar guy. He missed the entire season. You might get him for four or five. That's why the Eagles are interested in him. It's just because of that. It, it's it, And it's a bargain deal. Now, but here's the deal. With Gardner Johnson, I think the Eagles would go like this. No harm, no foul. I don't care. Getting a good player back. So what? He talks some shit. Plus, he's a Gator. You have to understand, Gators talk shit. Look at your GM. Okay? He's a Gator. So what that's you're you're always going to expect they got flat mouths. 
So Gardner Johnson's a gator. Okay. He talks shit. And is he good? Yeah. Would you want him back? Yeah. Oh, he, even some of the shit he talked? So what? I just got through telling you. I'd put a guy on my football team that talks some shit on me. As long as we can work together, it's all good. Hey, remember, kid, you know how I'm going to shut him up? Here's some money. Here's four and a half million bucks. If you can get that anywhere else in the open market, go get it. But you know that we can play you here, pay you here, and you'll be on one of those one-year deals again. And you go out there and you maybe get another opportunity to get a big contract. Gators hate hurricanes? Really? They should. We kicked the shit out of them every year I was there. Not true. <laughs> hey, not true. Okay? Not true. Okay? I think I, 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 not, not true. Like I had a 500 record against them guys. CJ hates Eagle fans. You just had a guy, you just had a guy in Darius Slay call you guys out on a podcast and said you guys are toxic and he's still on the team. What are you talking about? He, Darius Slay calls Eagle fans toxic. He hates Eagle fan. He's lying. He don't. He doesn't like Eagle fans. Let's be candid here. Darius Slay doesn't like you. He's only telling that to you so you don't boo him when he goes to the stadium. He doesn't give a shit about playing in Philly. He could care less being an Eagle. He, he's kind of got an attitude like a diva wide receiver. You think any of those guys give a shit where they play? They care about their numbers. They care about their paycheck. That's it. They could play on Pluto. These guys don't care. You think Tyree Kill cares he's in Miami? He probably hates being in Miami. And not in a town like Los Angeles or New York or Chicago. Play San Francisco, a big giant market where he could play ball in Miami down there. He don't care. That's why he does a lot of screaming on an anthill. Hey, I'm down here. Remember? Oh, yeah, I forgot. That's right. You're down there. That's right. I forgot you're down there. Okay. I have to do this. And I hate to do this to you. Folks, you don't really think Jason Kelsey's retired, do you? You don't think he's retired. No way. I got to see it. No way. What game do you think Jason Kelsey comes back this year? After week four? After week eight? After week 10? Okay. What do you think? Week four? Eight? Or after week 10? When does he come back? By the way, so Kelsey misses OTA's minicamp. He misses half the season, and he comes back for the playoff stretch run. And if you're struggling at center and right guard, you move Jurgens back to guard, and Kelsey plays. And Kelsey plays. He stayed retired. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. Xander's like, if we suck, he's probably staying retired. Don't forget, we're going to effort our friend Phil Sims at the bottom of the hour. We got Gary Cobb at 430, and we got Mike Gullick at 530. Just to do the brotherly shove? No. They could prorate his money, too. I say he comes back week eight. Or if Jurgen sucks, that could expedite it. If Jurgen sucks and the team sucks, he's probably not coming back. But if the team's playing well, they're in a playoff hunt, and they're in the hunt for home field, I say week eight. Miss half the season, 
All they're going to do is tell him to go through the walkthroughs, play on Sunday. Sure, I'm good with that. Pick help on picking up blitzes. I don't think there's a problem with that. And as an Eagle guy, Jason Kelsey coming back halfway through the season, giving him time to heal up a little more, might be just the thing he needs for a 37-year-old guy. I want to see this. You don't have that kind of emotion like that and break down like that in front of people and make it so hard for you to leave the game. Well, you think you're just going to go like this when September starts. Hey, uh, see you later, everyone. Hey, bye. Hey, aren't you off to camp? No, I'm going to sit around and play with my kids, and I'm going to have references for um, White Man Can't Shoot and also for um, Taylor Swift songs, and I'm going to have cliches, and I'm going to talk like that. I, I don't think, hey, I'm doing my podcast. I I... I don't look at that guy as a guy that's just going to go like this. Yeah, you know, I'm going to walk away from the game. All pro center, not pro bowler. All pro center is just going to go, you know, I've had it. I'm done. I think he comes back week eight. I think he comes back week eight, man. I'm going to talk about Slay and Bradbury here in a second, but before I do that, I do want to throw this at you because I got some insight here talking to Stephen Jones, who's been on the program numerous times. So here they are with Dak Prescott, and there's a little bit of a friction inside the locker room. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Michael Parsons on a podcast said that there's a culture issue inside the Dallas Cowboys locker room. I think most of you are going to love this take. And um, Michael Parsons says we have a, We have a problem inside the locker room with culture. Dak Prescott said, I got a problem with anybody that attacks our culture. And anybody that says that, I'm offended. So now you got Dak and Micah talking shit towards one another inside the locker room in the offseason. This is beautiful. Dude, the Cowboys and the Eagles are creating intense content here. And you're going to pay the guy $60 He's offended by Michael Parsons right now. Saying that the Cowboys have an, have a culture problem inside their locker room. You, you can't, hey, if you're an Eagle fan, with all the shit you've had and all the drama you've had, you're happy for this. You're happy. I don't, dude, Michael Parsons, if he's on any other team in National Football League, he, he, he's, he's another really good ball player. But because he plays in Dallas. Oh, and by the way, I saw some people ripping on me because you guys once again didn't get the point about Dak Prescott being the face of the league. Dak Prescott's not the best player in the league by far. He's not the best quarterback in the league. By far. More people know Dak Prescott around the world than Mahomes. And that's not that's not a hot take. He plays on the most popular and richest franchise in the world, the Dallas Cowboys. Where is Dak on the scale of quarterbacks in the league? 10? That's not the point. Just because you're the face of the league doesn't mean you're the best player in the league. It just doesn't. New England is a great example of this. Tom Brady was never the face of the league. Maybe later in his career. He was never. It was Peyton Manning. Because of the Manning name. It wasn't Brady. It was, it was never Brady until the end. Brady built the equity up at the end, probably more so when he was in Tampa. Okay? Seals, what if Creed Humphrey gets hurt? Do you think he goes to Kansas City? Joseph, I, I could see his brother talking him into that. If Creed Humphrey got hurt, 
going to Kansas City and winning a Super Bowl and playing with Mahomes. Oh, hey, you know, you don't want to ever have to see Jason Kelsey in another uniform. I think Eagle fans would do this, though, Joseph. I think they would go, well, he's going to Andy. Andy's kind of family. You know? You know, by the way, he did reference that whole unfortunate situation with his son at his retirement speech. And he did reference that like it was a thing in his heart. So if Andy Reid heard that, and I'm sure someone told him about that, that would matter. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's out of the realm. Of, I don't think that he's going to go like this. Well, if the Rams need a center, they can call me. I don't think he's going to do that. <laughs> Hell no. He's fucking up to Philly Love if he signs there. <laughs> and Xander, see, Xander may be a young dude, man, but he's got that old mentality. Loyal to the soil? Or you're not loyal at all. This is maybe why you guys like Jason Kelsey more than you do Reggie White. Because remember, Reggie was a Birmingham stallion first. And then he finished his career in Green Bay and in Carolina. His best years, though, were as an Eagle, of course. But because he had different uniforms on, maybe what people look at him the same way they look at A-Rod and they look at Jeter. Jeter's a homegrown guy. Jeter will always be revered. A-Rod was the better player. A-Rod by far was the better player. Had just as many gold gloves when they got to New York as Jeter did at shortstop. Remember who moved? It was A-Rod who moved to third. Okay, it was A-Rod. <laughs> Jeter wasn't moving to third. Nah, this is my team. <laughs> and that was... And, and, and A-Rod won MVP awards. He's got more home runs than any right-hand hit. Oh, no, Judge broke that now. But at the time, he had a 52-home run season, and nobody from the right side of the plate in Yankee history had hit more. He hit more than DiMaggio. And now Judge has got the record. Yeah. So it's kind of that. That's why people today look at Kelsey and go, is Kelsey the greatest eagle of all time? And they throw that comment out there and they go, is he the greatest eagle? Probably. Because I, and, and, and I think you're to your point, hey, you wear different gear. That's going to diminish the passion that fans have for you. Like, when Reggie went to Green Bay, nobody wanted to see Reggie, I'm sure, in Philly go to Green Bay. That had to be blasphemy watching him put a Green Bay Packer uniform on after all the great things that he did in Philly playing with Buddy. And when he left to go and they didn't want to pay him and the owner thought he was past his time and he went to Green Bay, he had to go to Green Bay. I mean, he had to go to Green Bay. It was dumbass cheap brain and didn't want to keep, uh, pick Reggie. I am pissed off all the at, at that time. Hey Steve, they just let him. Well, no, the room, the room, um, the rumor was Steve that um, that Brayman thought he was past his time and his best years were in his rearview mirror. See, I got concrete Charlie too, man. I don't know how you don't have Bed Eric anytime the conversation comes up. As the greatest eagle of all time, he has to be a two-way player. He's revered as the last great two-way player. He and he's like Deion Sanders of his time, but at big positions, center and Mike linebacker. I mean, he personifies what the NFL was. Got an award in college named after him. I mean, Chuck Bednarik is synonymous with the National Football League. You know, I think as we get further away from Bednarik and his era, you guys kind of forget about him. And it's unfortunate because he's a major part in a building block in the history of that franchise. Sales, the fans protested Reggie's departure. Pretty sure Angelo led that. Was a huge deal. I remember. I remember. You know, there was, there was a thought he was going to go to Cleveland. And Cleveland had offered him some pretty good money to go there. I think even Cleveland offered him more. 
Sills Kessley is stained in Green Bay. Uh, how dare you make me picture another jersey? <laughs> hey, Concrete is fourth on my list. Mike, one of the greatest players of all time. Yeah, absolutely, man. Truly a great point. All right. We're efforting our friend, Phil Sims. Hopefully we're able to catch up with him in this hour. Supposed to be coming up here in a couple minutes here at 2.30. So we'll keep on point with that. Now, I'll, I'll say this to you. I want to make a prediction also because we just did this with Jason Kelsey. It's with Slay and Bradbury. What's the more likely scenario? Both back? Both gone? Okay. Okay, so Phil just said, so he's coming on at 3.30. Okay? So we're pushing him to 3.30. Fantastic. Thank you, Xander. So 3.30 will be Phil Sims, 4.30 will be Gary Cobb, 5.30 will be Mike Golick. So we moved them back. Slay, Bradbury, both gone? Both back? One gone. Boy, I'll tell you. After what I saw with Russell Wilson and the amount of money, $85 million, the Broncos are eating in dead cap money. Now, they can defer some of that money with the new collective bargaining agreement, but that is a ton of dead cap money. The biggest one, I think, was $38 million, and it was Ryan in Atlanta, right? And I think what the Colts had to eat that before that, it was the Eagles with Wentz and Wentz, the the Eagles had to eat 33 of it, $85 million teams are now willing to eat on their cap. Holy shit. That, I mean, just to get them out of the building, let me give you a little insight on how this is playing out. No matter what, hey, Xander, how would you like this? He's being paid $39 million this year by the Broncos. No matter what, in 25, he's being paid $37 million. The next two years, he's got guarantees of 39 this year, 37 next year. So I wouldn't be crying about Russell Wilson getting whacked in Denver. And you want to hear the thing that he can do? He could go to the Washington Commanders right now, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and sign a league minimum contract of $1.29 million and give a team a bargain basement deal. And get this, of that money that's owed to him, 90% of the contract, 96% of the contract will still be paid by Denver. Because this is how it'll work. They'll take the portion of the 129, say that Pittsburgh or Washington gives them, and they'll just take it off to 39. So what are you talking about here, 37 this year? The Broncos will pay $37 million if he signs a league minimum contract, which means this, he's got a massive market. Do you know how do, – do you know how that is so enticing to a guy with 26 touchdowns and nine picks? This guy had a good – this guy had the same year as the MVP in the league did. He had a higher passer rating. He had just as many touchdowns as the league MVP. It's not like he sucked. And by the way, did you see his exit – what he what he mentioned? He mentioned the like, he mentioned like the garbage men. He mentioned like the cafeteria people. Not one mention of Sean Payton. So that relationship was never going to work. Was never going to work. I mean, 
How many teams around the league would like to only pay $1.29 million for a quarterback who can still start in this league? He, they, by the way, the Broncos didn't do him any favors by hiring Nathaniel Hackett. That was a bullshit hire. You bring him in and you hire Nathaniel Hackett. Why? Because he is friends with Aaron Rodgers? What's that got to do with Russell Wilson? It never fit. It never fit. Wilson's not the kind of style player Rodgers is. It was never going to work. They didn't help him. Was it? I will say this to you. Hey, off the top of you guys' hand, uh, head here, what, how many, what was the bounty of picks that the Broncos had to give to the Seahawks to get him? Because I could make the argument, that's the worst trade in the history of the National Football League. Okay, at least the Vikings got Herschel Walker back. And Walker had some productive years for him. Now, Jimmy, Jimmy hijacked the Vikings in picks. It wasn't just two ones. Like two, it was like three, it was two ones in one year, another one the following year. And it was like, that's right, two second rounders plus the money. It's the worst trade in the history of the National Football League. With the amount of money, and now Denver has to eat. Look at how unbelievable. That's worse than the Trey Lance draft choice of three ones because of the money. And you don't have an answer. Look, look, San Francisco has Brock Purdy to fall back on. Denver has nothing to fall back on. One of the worst moves in NFL history. And the Eagles could have been in exactly the same position because Howie had a deal on the table for Russell Wilson. The same deal. Wilson voided it. You could be going through this right now. Sometimes the best deals you make are the deals you don't make. Worse than a fully guaranteed contract. Senor, it's a good, I mean, Deshaun is coming in on that one too. I'll say that that's $230 million guaranteed. That guy doesn't turn that thing around this year. That could go down as the greatest. Okay? That could go down. Let's see what Watson does this year. I thought he was starting to turn it around. Now Denver's going to overdraft a crappy quarterback. Brutal. Right? They have to. They have to. That's why Sertan is out there. Would you give up two ones this year, one, and the next year, one for Sertan? If you think your team's so good. Because next year you'll be picking in the 20s too, won't you? For a lockdown corner who's just had his fifth-year option picked up. You wouldn't do that for Patrick Sertan, the best corner in the league. No. Hear that? He'd rather draft a corner and you, Steve, why wouldn't you do that when you can't draft a corner? Steve would rather take a gamble. Anthony would rather take a gamble in the draft where you failed miserably at than giving, hey, you're going to have to pay something. LJ says it's a deep cornerback class. Oh, this is going to be fabulous. I'm going to write this down. Hey, James, here's something for Howie Roseman. And I'm going to go with LJ here. With this class in 2024 being one of the deepest classes at the cornerback position and offensive line and wide receiver, if Howie Roseman screws up the linebacker position, or he screws up a cornerback pick, we will know for a fact he sucks at those positions. It's a pretty good class 
for defensive players, especially at the corner. And if he can't get one of these guys right, this will be a statement that he should never draft a cornerback ever again as long as he's in charge of the personnel of the Eagles. This will be the 24th year that Roseman has had some say in the personnel, and he's never landed on one corner. He's had a Renum. Okay? He has, okay, LJ. We're going to roll the dice one more loser time for Howie Roseman in the NFL draft where he sucks on defense. Okay. I'm going to go with you guys. Personally, those draft picks, if you guys think you're as good as you think you are, so say you guys get to the NFC title game, your pick will be 27 next year. So you wouldn't give up the 22nd pick and the 27th pick for a corner that's all pro and 24. I don't know what you're looking at. I I, I really don't. And he's on a fifth-year option. You got this year rookie deal, then the fifth year next year. You got two years of not having to pay him market price, and you don't want to do that. And you're telling me two years of Patrick Sertan on a rookie contract with the fifth-year option being picked up by Denver. You think the 22nd pick and the 27th pick of next year, if you guys are as good as you think you are, is not worth Patrick Sertan. And you'd rather take a gamble in the night where you know this guy can't find his hand from his ass in the dark when it comes to corners. Brother goes like this, too many holes. Okay, well, let me do this. So you put Patrick Sertan on the other side of Darius Slay in your cornerback and you draft a safety or you sign a safety and you put him back there, you're telling me you haven't addressed your secondary F- fiscally responsibly too? You're not overpaying for Sertan for the next two years. You got a decent safety you put back there and you drafted another one and you got some from a year ago with depth and you got Reed Blankenship that could come in as your third guy. You're not telling me you don't think you've addressed your secondary. And you haven't spent a king's ransom. I mean, send the trade right now. Denver needs a quarterback. So they're going to want to remember what else is over their head this coming draft. They had to give a first-round pickup for Sean Payton to New Orleans. Okay? They had to give up another first-rounder. So look at what they've given up in equity of draft equity and money. You got $85 bucks in dead cap money. You, in theory... For Russell Wilson gave up two ones, two twos, a three. Then you, for Sean Payton, had to give New Orleans another first rounder. You basically have given up four first round picks for Sean Payton and Russell Wilson. Three first round picks for Sean Payton and Russell Wilson. And a multiple of twos and threes. They need draft equity. You know why they have to have draft equity? They got $85 million of dead cap. If I'm the Eagles, hey, what'd you think about us trading Hassan Reddick to you?
We'll trade Hassan Reddick to you. You give us a pick. They're probably not going to do that because they need they need draft picks. Them that's probably out. But trading for Sertan? How about making a package up with Reddick and the first round pick? And you don't have to give up the one next year. I don't know. I I think they're going to want two ones for him. He's 24. Okay, remember, Darrell Rivas, Buccaneers, Jets, Patriots. Hall of Famer. Okay? Now, LJ's got a point. Jalen Ramsey was good a year, I thought. Maybe two in L.A., but the amount of first rounders, LJ, what was how many first rounders did they give Jacksonville for Ramsey? Two? The, was it two first rounders? I thought he was good. But two ones, they did win a Super Bowl with him. Did that pan out? Probably. It, it, but if it's three, I don't know, because I thought he was good two years in L.A. Sills, if Denver would take 24 and 25 first, I'd go pick him up myself. I'd stop and pick up Geno Stone on the ride back. You, 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 you would solidify your entire secondary with that with that move. And Stone's going to cost you $7 million, $6 million. bucks. you are on a rookie deal for the next two years with Sertain. You gave up a first-round pick. Hey, you guys, you guys didn't have a problem when you gave up a first rounder for AJ. Why would you have a problem giving up for a guy like Subtain who's 24 years old? Sills, remember how long we had to hang on to Whiteside because of Lori's arrogance and Howie's fragile psyche. Cut slaying Bradbury and eat it. That's another thing. <clears throat> that hey, I thought about that. I thought about that. But I would keep Slay. You know, I threw that out at you. Both back, both gone. One gone. I'm getting rid of Bradbury and eating that money. Now that I see teams are willing and you can defer some of the money, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of Bradbury. And I'm going to fill that spot with Sertain or Trade or someone. Okay? See, the difference between Jalen Johnson... Chicago's tagging him. That means you have to give up two ones. Well, you'd still have to give up two ones for Sertan, too. But he's better. Patrick Sertain's better. Sills, what do you think of Braden Fisk? Um, I, I don't know what his market value is. I'm going to have to look that up. I don't I don't know what his market value is. So there's a way. To, hey, you're not going to be able to fix this in the draft. You have to fix your defense in free agency. You understand this. You may land on a guy who's going to be a really look. Look at this. Would you not agree that Jalen Carter? was one of the best players in the draft this past April. Would you not agree? Did What kind of impact did he have on the overall defense? None. And I thought he had a great year for a rookie. Arguably the best. Okay. Him and Devin Witherspoon, right? Arguably the best. Had no impact on your meltdown at the end of the year, did he? So a guy in the draft is a guy in the draft. Very seldom does a guy turn a team around from the draft on defense. Can you name me one guy that's come out of college and turned a team around 
and was a championship football team by one single guy on defense in the last five years. Can you name me one? That made him a Super Bowl contending team. Because he's he fixed the defense. Not even Michael Parsons. That guy evaporates in the second half of the season. Thought Will Anderson had a get this. I thought Will Anderson was outstanding this year. And they were a good playoff team. That's about the limit. But if you get Sertain or you're getting a Roquan Smith or Patrick Queen or Brian Burns, you know what you're bringing in? Pros that could turn your team around. Look at what Hassan Reddick did for your pass rush when you brought him in. I would make the argument that Hassan Reddick in his first year with the Eagles had a bigger impact than Jalen Carter ever did. It's because one guy was a pro and the other guy was a rookie. Seals, would you give Ringo a chance? I like the kid. Martin, the Eagles have so much money spent on offense right now and have a championship offensive talented roster. I'm not breaking anybody in. I'm playing him and I'm giving him a chance. But I need to win now. While those salary cap hits of Jalen Hurts is not strangleholding my cap. They've got to take advantage of that. They're on a runway. Do you know they're on a time clock now? Let me do this to you. And I'll ask it one more time. You think Jalen Hurts is in line for another contract in Philadelphia at $60 million plus a year? Would you give Jalen Hurts $60 million if this was his last year going into a new contract extension? Anthony says no. You'd make him the highest play, paid player. Okay. By the way, Yes, it's a hypothetical. But I'm telling you where he is today. If Jay, I'm telling you where he is right now. They would not today, with that decision, give him a contract and a contract extension. They wouldn't. They would give Allen. They would give Burrow. They wouldn't hurts. And here's why. Dude, we've spent all this. How much more do you need to win a Super Bowl? I don't think it's 27. I think it's 26. There's a review in the contract. Be awesome if someone commented off of what act happens on the actual field and stop basing their opinions on what they on what they read. I'm not sure what that means. Could you say maybe Parsons here? Dallas always paper champions. Um I, I don't know what the love affair is with Michael Parsons. I think he's overrated. No, I'll take it back. I think he's overhyped. I don't think he's as good as people think he is. I think he's a fine ball player. I think he'd do a lot of things. He's got a lot of skill. But that guy's not a $30 million guy. Like, when you look at Michael Parsons, do you see Miles Garrett? Or TJ Watt? Do you see those two guys? Shield, do you... Shit, do you see Khalil Mack? Do, do, do you see those guys in, when you watch Parsons play? I don't see that. I mean, he, even his own contemporaries. I don't see... Miles Garrett's going to Canton. He, he's going to go down the highway and he's going to get a gold jacket. He's a gold jacket player. TJ Watt's a gold jacket, maybe, guy. And I think he's right there. Okay? 
Uh, uh, LJ, you're, we're not comparing the talents of Burrow as a passer versus Hurts, are we? You think Jalen Hurts is as good a passer as Joe Burrow? Now, here's the thing with Burrow. Joe, name it Burrow. He needs to stay healthy. He gets criticism from me, too. Can't build a team around a guy who's always hurt, dude. Can't build a team around that. You got to show us you could play 17 ball games and take a team into the AFC title game again. You got to be hurt. There's always something wrong with this guy, too. Yeah, great player. Spectacular arm. But one of the big disadvantages that that guy has is that he came out as an older player. He was a fifth-year senior. So you're talking about a guy who's 22, 23 years old. That was a couple years ago. We're talking about a guy getting past the 25, 26-year-old mark now, and we're looking at a guy, hey, dude, you know, we're, we're on a time clock here. We're on a time clock. So he has only big play in his mind. And it's, I didn't think he played horribly last year. Martin says, Dan, do you think the way our offense was called that any other quarterback could do better in his situation? It's look what good OC did for Hurts when they went to their Super Bowl. I, I no, um, Look, that played a lot into it, especially when you look at his throw chart. It was predictable. They wanted him to go to a certain place. Um, you, you, you wanted to get the ball to AJ, which is not wrong to want to get the ball to AJ. Your tight end kind of shit the bed again with injuries. Your running attack was not what it was a year ago. The play calling was inconsistent and Nick sucks as a play and Nick sucks as an offensive game plan organizer. He sucks at it. And the Eagles know that. You know, I hear people like Bill and everyone going, this guy does a really good job. And his his organizing of a game plan blows. He's 12 and 11. Xander, am I not right? You know, you know, the first year I came on here, you know, you know what Krause was saying to me? Dude, you think this guy makes it to the midway point of the year? When they were two and five, Xander goes like this. Sills, you think this guy's gonna make the season? He thought he was going to be maybe one of those guys that were going to get whacked right in the midway point because it was a joke. And him as a play calling, play designing OC head coach, he was two and five. And then last year, they were 11 and six. So think about what he is. Okay, think about it. This guy's like 13 and 12 as a head coach when the offense is in his hands. The other part of it was when Steichen had it. He's a horrendous play designing head coach. His record speaks to it. Last year, he told us all year long, this is my offense. This is my offense. Okay, Nick, you own it then. This is your offense. He even so much came to say, Brian Johnson is just the play caller of my offense. Those were almost exact words, okay? He's 13 and 12, running an offense in Philly. He's not this 667 guy. That's why he almost lost his job. Okay? I don't think Nick, but less than 20% of the coaches. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. Andy Reid calls his own plays. Sean McVay calls his own plays. Kyle Shanahan calls his own plays. Those are the dominant teams that are the true contenders for the Super Bowl. You don't think there's any coincidence to that? I would make this point of all the teams that were in the NFC and AFC title game. Okay. Then look at the Super Bowl. 
You had two play calling head coaches. Okay. Two play calling head coaches that were in the Super Bowl. You think that was a coincidence? I think that's what every football team today aspires to want to have is a play calling head coach. Chris Long said this. This is not a Dan Cilio take. So I'm kind of borrowing this. Okay, Prince, this is not me saying. Chris said, hey, I think this guy's not around for a long time because when they figured out he can't play call and he's the head coach, I mean, his time is ticking as the head coach of the Eagles. This organization is a mess. It's not a mess. D coordinator will be here for a season. Maybe. GM can't build through the draft. To a point. Coach is a puppet. True. Losing their two best players. Not true. Hold on to gets too long. Four wins next year. No. I, um... Their problems are on defense, and they're not losing their two best players. Kelsey's a great player. He's a great player. Um, Fletcher Cox is not their second best player. If I was to rank their five players, their five best football players right now are Jordan Mulata, A.J. Brown, Lane Johnson. Devontae Smith. Landon Dickerson. Uh, Pert Hurts, probably sixth. Best players. Carter, we'll see. But if I had to pick the five best players at their respected positions in the league, Let's say this. Malad is one of the top three left tackles in the sport, and he's your best athlete on the team. I'd, I'd take him one. AJ, two, top three receivers in the league. Um, I would take Lane, top two, right? Top two tackles in the game. Isn't it crazy the Eagles have two of the top three offensive tackles in the sport, and you guys were one and seven down the stretch? Milton Williams is not a top, it's not a top five defensive tackle. Oh, no, no. Okay. I understand what you're uh, five best players on the team. Mulata, AJ, Lane, Landon, Devontae, Hertz would be six. That's what I would do. Those are your five best players right now. And unfortunately, I didn't name anybody on defense. No, I didn't forget Devontae. He's fifth. Okay, so, all right. Phil Sims is going to join us at the bottom of the hour at 3.30 Eastern time. Got a bunch of questions for him. Want to get his thoughts on the Eagles. I want to know what the love affair is also with Daniel Jones and New York. Gary Cobb will join us at 430. A little more on Jason Kelsey on his impact now not being on the team means that Cam Jurgens and Jalen have a lot on their shoulders. Hit the like button. Keep it here. National Football Show. <laughs> 